cosmological constant is much bigger, which is expected, but then life wouldn't have formed, so we're not there, we can't ask the question. I don't like that kind of answer. I want to calculate this. And I expect that in the end we should, but it is an enormously difficult challenge. And one that will probably remain for, with us for some time. Well, we have this wonderful theory of all of these quarks and the electron and its friend, the neutrino, which has been in the news lately. And we don't have just one family, we have three families. Heavier quarks that we produce in accelerators. And we have these forces, electricity and magnetism, the strong and weak force. This is an amazingly successful theory. It really is a great triumph of physics. This theory explains almost everything we have ever measured, except for dark matter, dark energy. It explains atom atomic physics. It explains molecular physics. Chemistry, presumably all of biology, is all, all of particle physics, nuclear physics. We have been searching desperately for years and years to find new phenomena that are not explained, new questions that we can ask if we can't explain something with the standard model. But we haven't been able to, and we have no indication that this theory breaks down until we get to very small distances. And it works everywhere in the galaxy and th throughout the whole universe. The same laws, the same particles, we can measure the properties of atoms in other galaxies and see that they're governed by the same physics. This theory works over 60 factors of 10 in size and is well tested many thousands and thousands of high precision experiments. But even within this theory, there are questions we ask, like the masses of the quarks and leptons are not part of the theory. We simply have to measure them. And over the last 30 years, we've been measuring the properties of the quarks and leptons they have a bizarre and weird pattern that we don't understand. We simply have to measure it and then use those numbers to calculate other properties of matter. The top quark, the heaviest quark, is 58,000 times the heavier than the up quark, which is present in our protons and neutrons. Why is that so? Can we calculate this? And we have no idea how to do that, and have so far been totally unsuccessful. So there are many, many questions and aspects of the standard model that we don't understand. And then we, you know, one of the deep consequences of relativistic relativity in quantum mechanics is that if we have any particle with a charge or some other a charge, there must be an antiparticle, a particle with the opposite charge and the same mass, exactly the same mass and the, exactly an opposite charge, so the two of them can annihilate into radiation, say, which has no charges. But we're all made out of protons and quarks and the only time we see antiparticles is when we collide particles in accelerators. Why is there so little antimatter? You'd think if the universe starts out from nothing, you'd have an equal amount of matter and antimatter. Well, we think we know how we might go about understanding that. It was actually Andrei Sakharov who first gave a strategy how to calculate and understand, but we don't know why there is 
a little excess of matter left over so that when all the antimatter and matter annihilates, we have the possibility of us being around and existing. And then one of the most important questions for particle physics, for fundamental physics, is the unification of the forces. If we extrapolate the forces and we go to higher energy or longer distances, the force between quarks, the nuclear force, gets weaker. That's, sorry, shorter distances. That's asymptotic freedom. And that offers the possibility that the other forces all unify together with a strong nuclear force at some very short distance. The electrical force actually gets stronger when we go to short distances. And if you take the standard model and extrapolate to very high energies, very short distances, it looks like the forces unify. In fact, it looks like they unify together with the force of gravity. The force of gravity, for most people, is the only force they feel directly every day when they get out of bed. Which is strange because it is incredibly weak force. You know, the force between the electron and the proton is the force of electricity. The force of gravity between the electron and the proton is 40 orders of magnitude, 10 to the 40 times weaker in the atom. The reason you feel the force of gravity is that there's this big planet beneath us, which has 10 to the 50 atoms in it. But here's an experiment that shows you that gravity is really very weak. And the experiment is, I'm holding this up. Now the whole Earth, with its 10 to the 50 atoms, is pulling down. And I'm exerting a little bit of electrical force, a little bit of chemical energy, which is all electricity. And with this little bit of chemical energy, I can resist the whole Earth. But gravity becomes stronger when particles are moving very fast. Because the source of gravity is mass, and mass is the same as energy, m equals e equals mc squared. So when you go to a very, if the quarks are, or electron, proton are moving with very high energies, the force is very big. And at this point, gravity becomes important. So for 30 years now, more, we've been trying to unify, based on this clue, all of the forces of nature. And the most promising approach, which is still far from completion to that, is a theory called string theory. Which one way of looking at things says that all of these different particles, quarks, leptons, electrons, neutrinos, the quanta of the fields, like the photon, the quanta of light, and the other fields that hold the quarks together, and of gravity, gravitons, are all different vibrations of a single string, like object. Well, we don't know whether this approach will pan out or not. It has had many successes in explaining aspects of gravity for the first time, and standard model physics, and even condensed matter physics nowadays. But it's still far from this goal of unifying the theories in a predictive fashion. And it raises the next few questions which have to do with the nature of space and time. For example, in string theory, 
we discover that there are often in our description of nature more than three spatial dimensions up this way, that way. In fact, the simplest solutions of string theory, there are at each point in space six extra dimensions whose structure can be determined by solving the equations and discovering that it's possible that these extra dimensions are curled up into these beautiful little spaces whose geometry and topology determine the nature of the forces, the kind of matter, the values of those masses that we observe in the larger world. We're simply too big to see these extra dimensions at each point in space. An even stranger possibility, perhaps, that string theory led to, but is even more general, is quantum dimensions of space. We realize that it is possible to have directions you can move in which are quantum in nature. Therefore, you can't move very far. They're not like really ordinary dimensions. We call those super dimensions or super space. And it, we have many, many speculations that physics actually lives in this super space and has super symmetries. And remarkably, there are clues from observation and our theoretical understanding that tell us that there's a very good chance that this, these super new quantum dimensions could be observed soon at this incredible new collider that is built outside of Geneva. If you fly over Geneva on a good day, you might see this white circle, a tunnel 19 kilometers across, which lies 200 meters below the surface and goes through France and then back through Switzerland. And in that tunnel, there is a vacuum pipe filled with, uh, cooled by liquid helium, which is 27 kilometers in circumference. Protons go one way at essentially the speed of light, anti-protons anti-particle of the proton in the other way. No, sorry, in the case of uh, the LHC, they're both protons, one going in two separate tubes. They are held in place and accelerated by incredibly powerful magnets, which are superconducting. And that's achieved by cooling them with 50,000 tons of liquid helium, cooled to 1.9 degrees Kelvin. This is roughly half the helium that exists in the world is in this tunnel. And this is the coldest place, in a sense, in the universe. It's extremely cold. Around that tunnel that you saw, these proton beams are accelerated to enormous energies, so much so that when the machine is working at full capacity, the total energy stored in those beams of protons is equivalent to the energy of an aircraft carrier moving at 30 knots through the water. 11 gigajoules. That makes this machine extremely sensitive and dangerous. If the beam gets out of control, you dump all of that energy and In fact, that happened when they first turned the machine on three years ago. There was a little accident. 
as they were just beginning to turn on the machine, much less than 11 gigajoule. They fixed that, and now they are, in fact, sending these protons around, and every once in a while, three, four places in the circle, they bring the beams together, and the protons collide, and they have constructed massive detectors to see what happens. This is one of the detectors, and this is the biggest one, called Atlas. This is a person in the middle of the detector. The detector is made out of concentric rings of materials that measure the properties of the particles that emerge from the collisions. They are unbelievable constructions. This is, are the pyramids of the 21st century except that they're much better than the pyramids. The pyramids were built to honor some dead king, to make sure he would live forever. These, this machine, which cost almost $10 billion, and these detectors, which cost about a billion dollars a piece, have a hundred million electron, electronic channels, they collect data. The number of collisions that happen is 40 million collisions every second. In each collision, hundreds of particles come out and the tracks are measured as they pass through these various detectors. That's much too many bytes of information to even imagined story. So within 10 nanoseconds, you have to reduce this amount of data to only 200 hertz, uh, 200 events you can keep out of 40 million. You collect and store that data at the level of petabytes per year, distributed throughout the collaboration, for each detector, which consists of about 2,000 PhDs, physicists working on each detector, analyzing these. By now, they have observed um, something like a trillion, a million, million events. This is a picture of what, one of the first collisions, which occurred about a year and a half ago, when they started to take data in the as seen in this collider, in this uh, CMS detector. This is actually one of the very first collisions that they observed. And what they have to do is take this picture, you see the tracks of all the particles, and figure out what happened. And do we understand what happened on the basis of our theory, which works so well, or is it something new that gives us a clue as to new physics. Now you can imagine, you have a million, million such events, which look pretty complicated, and out of that you have to pick out the few events that might be, for example, an indication of this super space, or of dark matter. An event like this where there's all these energy going this way, and nothing visible going this way. So maybe that missing energy is some new heavy particle. That's how we hope to discover dark matter. And maybe these new super space, which predicts, one of the reasons we believe in such speculations is that it predicts particles like that. So physicists all over the world for the last year and a half have been enormously excited and anticipating the new discoveries at the LHC. So far, they haven't come, but the story is just beginning. They have about less than 1% of the information they will collect over the next 10 years. And they could discover, my expectation and hope, is that they will discover these quantum dimensions of space and time. But we will see. 
this and, and other questions uh, will be answered by this new accelerator. What they might not answer are more profound questions that have come from exploring string theory, for example, which tends to suggest that space and time, our primary concept of the physical world, might be an, only an approximate concept. Space and time might be an emergent description of nature, which is pretty good for describing ordinary physics and atomic physics and nuclear physics, but at very short distances breaks down. In a sense, we are being pushed to ask uh, a fascinating question. We have many clues how we might answer that question. What is space-time made of? And that is very challenging, and the answer to that will probably take quite a while. I'm going to end by describing some branches of physics that occupy most physicists who are not exploring the basic laws of physics or properties of space-time or the Big Bang, but rather the physics of ordinary matter, atoms and molecules. And that is not only tremendously exciting and um, great advances are being made, but it is also of great practical value, since most of our technology has been based on advances in this field of atomic physics. In the last decade, we have made extraordinary progress in constructing new materials and in gaining new control and understanding. For example, last year's Nobel Prize was for the discovery of graphene, a sheet of carbon atoms, a single layer of graphite, which is a two-dimensional material with remarkable properties. Remarkable properties that are of great interest to physicists, because of their amazing uh, range of different phenomena that can be created and studied in the laboratory uh, that theorists have dreamt about for years, but also for technology, because it is this material which is incredibly strong and has unheard of electronic properties that will surely be the basis for much of the for many new technologies in the 21st century. But this is only an example of being able to create new forms of matter by manipulating and things at the level of individual atoms. In the framework of atomic physics, we are able to create matter that uh, does, we don't find in ordinary materials in nature around us by placing, through various techniques, atoms at specific places using quantum optics. And to change the distances and arrangements of these atoms to create models uh, of insulators or superfluids and study the transition between them. We have increasing control over matter and at the level of individual atoms. And this opens up uh, vistas and horizons uh, for both understanding the quantum dynamics of ordinary matter and creating new forms of matter and controlling them uh, that is uh, whose implications are will go on for the rest of this century. 
One of the most interesting and motivating ideas at the present is the possibility of using such atomic control, control over um, matter at the atomic level, to construct a new form of compu computers, which, if developed, might come at the right time, since we are beginning to get close to the threshold of ordinary uh, computers based on silicon chips. Classical computers are based on bits of information, zeros and one, which carry one byte of information, and the classical computer manipulates tapes of zeros and ones. Classical computers uh, are limited, however, in what they can do. And many of the problems, that computational problems that we encounter are too hard for any conceivable computer ever. The complexity grows exponentially. Humans are linear. Human capability and money and energy and power is a linear function usually. Classical computers are based on these simple bits. Zero, one, or if you want, up, down. Now in quantum, in the real world, we have particles that naturally point up or point down, just like these bits of information. For example, a, an electron spins, it has a rotation, which can only take, because of quantum mechanics, two values, up or down. So you could use electrons, you would think, as bits. Except that electrons are quantum mechanical bits. In quantum mechanics, we can do something called superimpose. We can have an up electron plus the up state of an electron spin plus the down state. In quantum mechanics works in a much larger space we call Hilbert space. And an electron, the spin of an electron doesn't just live up, down. It can be any combination of up and down in a quantum sense. That leads to many strange and weird aspects of quantum mechanics, but here, for the point of view of computing, it's incredibly useful. This much larger space of a quantum bit, not just zero or one, but sort of any combination of zero and one, means that if you could construct a quantum computer, an array, a manipulable array of such quantum bits, it is, we understand the case that many problems that are beyond the access of any classical computer could be tackled. There's much interest in this because one of the problems that could be tackled is how to factor large numbers. And all of the security of the internet is controlled by factoring large numbers. When you buy something on the internet and give your credit card, the reason that's secure is that there is a key based on the product of two large primes. And if you knew how to factor very large numbers into products, you could steal everybody's credit card number. And that's why there's a lot of money going into this attempt to construct a quantum computer. But the problem is that quantum mechanics, well, the problem is that this quantum computer is very fragile. 
when once it comes into contact with the environment, it loses the quantum coherence and it becomes a mere classical computer. So all the, in theory, a quantum computer is easy to construct. But in practice, it would require incredible control over this quantum state, this delicate coherence of quantum states that is easily destroyed by coming into contact with the environment. People say it'll take 50 years to construct a quantum computer. But the truth is, no one knows. And there are many fascinating attempts to do this. There's no question that someday it will be constructed. The only question really is how long and by what method. Physicists, as I said at the beginning, do biology as well. I call it, at my institute, which does, runs programs in theoretical physics, we call it the physics of living matter. And the physics of condensed matter, of particles, physics of living matter, very interesting kind of physics. And physicists have something to contribute, I think, especially if there is a theory of biology, of life. Biologists aren't sure that there is a theory. Some of them believe, well, life just happened. Natural selection picked out. You know, whatever it is that it selected for, survival, there's no theory. But more and more, I think it's becoming clear that there are principles and theoretical physics can help. And let me give you an indication of the kind of questions that physicists are asking or interested in. There's another interesting question, whether we need new mathematics for biology. Much of the mathematics we use was developed for physics. Biology, living matter, might require some new mathematical tools. One of the things physicists address in biology is genomics. We now have mapped the gene, not just of us, but of many organisms. Can we make the theory of evolution quantitative? Not just a, a a posteriori theory explanation. Can we make it predictive? We can now do experiments in the laboratory follow the evolution of bacteria and sequence their genome and try to develop an explanation of their evolution, make predictions, test them. One way I like to put this is, can you tell the shape of an organism by looking at its genome? And I imagine the final exam in theoretical genomics, a field that doesn't really exist yet, a year, uh, hundred years from now. So, the final exam in theoretical genomics, problem one, based on this genetic sequence, draw a picture of the organism. All the information is there. This is the answer. <laughs> Another field that physicists have played more, you know, or get involved in because it clearly requires a theory, a model, even to do the experiments, is neuroscience. And there, there are fascinating questions, and these are some that physicists like to ask because they require modeling theory. What are the principles that lead of self-organization? We are just a bunch of atoms, molecules, somehow organized to produce memory and consciousness. And how does that work? It's the laws of physics, chemistry, which is physics, can one Make a machine, for example, that does that. 
a machine that would have free will. And finally, the question, a question I really like about the most mysterious of the properties of the mind, which is consciousness, which we find hard even to define. What is consciousness? How does it work? Well, one way a physicist might ask this question is, can one measure the onset of consciousness, whatever it is, in an infant? So what I mean by that is, we, we plot consciousness. Now, I don't know what consciousness is. Consciousness versus age. One thing we are pretty sure of, is whatever consciousness is, an embryo is, doesn't have it. So an embryo, before it is born, is not conscious, right? And a teenager probably is conscious. So somewhere, consciousness turns on. Now physicists have found it useful in discovering and understanding the different phases of matter, liquid, solid, not to try to get to a complete understanding of the different phases, but to study the transition from one to another, phase transition, because that is easier to detect and often teaches you a lot about the nature of unconscious or conscious. So what is the nature of the transition? Does consciousness suddenly turn on? You know, you're unconscious, like you're sleeping, and then you wake up and you're suddenly conscious? Or is it continuous? Now, the answer, or to start answering such a question, you don't really have to know what consciousness is. You just have to be able to measure something that correlates, that is connected to consciousness. And you can study it then, not just with humans, but with other animals. Are dogs conscious? Most of us would think so, but what about flies? At some point in the history of evolution, consciousness turns on. Anyway, these are the kinds of approaches that a physicist takes to the physics of living matter. So those are some of the questions that physics, physicists, along this wide range from the history and structure of the universe to the structure of the basic particles of matter and the forces the nature of space and time to the physics of living matter are asking, and that is the future of science. And I'm going to end just with one other question, which is more sociological and historical, and I know the answer, and that is, oops, <laughs> and that, I'm not being allowed to ask that, and that is, Will physics continue to be important, as it has in the past? And the answer to that, of course, is yes. Thank you.